Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video on Elisa Childer's channel. You may remember her from my video published in September of 2021, where she defended slavery by ignoring most of the verses in the Bible that talk about it, and focusing on the two instances of Bible verses that say Hebrew slaves go free after six years. But what she doesn't mention is that one of those two instances explicitly states that Hebrew women do not go out as the men do, but are permanent slaves along with any children that she bears, notably with no mention of whether there is a similar distinction between male and female slave babies. Or slavies, to turn a horrendous concept into a cute portmanteau, making it seem like such children are permanent chattel slaves by default. Anyway, in this video she's interviewing a guy who looks like the store brand of Adam Conover, who seeks to answer the question, was the resurrection of Jesus just imaginative storytelling. For myself, I'd fall on the side of it not necessarily being imaginative storytelling, but certainly it is the result of a story being exaggerated as it is retold over the decades before it gets written down. Combine that with some rather obvious retrospective insertions meant to make the story match with certain prophecies, and boom, you get the Gospels. Anyway, let's see what they have to say! You mentioned earlier the concept of imaginative storytelling that you're, when you went in to give your thesis and they, they offered that it might have just been imaginative storytelling. I mean, it seems to me that it would have been very difficult for Christianity to get off the ground if it was just mm -hmm. imaginative storytelling. Why though? If you come up with an imaginative story that people find believable, then that story can, and often does, get off the ground. Just look at Mormonism. Elisa is not a Mormon as far as I can tell, so she likely does not believe that Joseph Smith translated golden plates by magically reading them while putting his face in a hat with his magic stones. Nor is she likely to believe the stories that he was supposedly translating, involving not one, but two transatlantic journeys made by ancient Israelites, one of which was in wooden submarines. And yet, if you ask the Mormons, there are over 17 million believers. Of course, they pad their numbers by making it incredibly difficult to have your name officially removed from their membership records. It's estimated that only 30% of their members actually regularly attend services, leaving us with about 5.1 million members, which is still a lot. Worldwide, that amounts to more adherence than Jainism, and if we go with their claimed 17 million number, that makes them bigger than Judaism. But to reiterate, Elisa would likely agree that the stories of Mormonism are just imaginative creations. So what makes them different from the story of Jesus? Um, and, and one of the things that, that you touch on in your book, which is I'm really interested in right now, I'm kind of fascinated by this idea, because sometimes skeptics, when you mention the resurrection, they might say something like, well, the, the disciples were just trying to save face, or they were trying to redeem the whole thing by making up this story of a resurrection. You know, they thought Jesus was going to do all these things, and then he died, so they had to kind of make good out of it. That's not how I would phrase it, but yeah, if we start with the assumption that the character of Jesus portrayed in the Bible was actually based on a real guy who managed to amass a bit of a following of people who believed he was the Messiah, but he ended up getting crucified, then it makes sense that some of his followers were so dedicated that they would have searched for rationalizations that could have made the events that happened make sense in light of their beliefs about scripture. This sort of, I'm in this deep so I need to make it make sense even if that means going deeper mentality is so commonplace among humans that we actually have a name for it. It's called the sunk cost fallacy. If you gave up your life and left your friends and family behind in order to follow a guy who you thought was the messiah and were involved in that for several years, then when he gets arrested and executed by the Romans, are you going to be comfortable heading back home to your friends and family with your head hung low in shame, where you'll likely have to endure a plethora of I told you so's? No. Of course not. And for some, this would cause them to search for ways in which you could still have been right about him having been the messiah, in spite of his arrest and execution. And as has been pointed out by myself and others on numerous occasions, in order for Christianity to get started, you don't even need all twelve of the disciples to do this. I mean, a lot of the disciples have dubious historicity claims for themselves anyway, so I'm not even sure you would have had twelve guys, but you just need one or two. Um, but, but you point out in your book that that's that, that would be very out of character uh, for the Jewish mindset uh, from back then. Well, in all honesty, we can never be certain what the Jewish mindset from back then would have been. 
All we have to go on are the writings from that time period that have survived, and we can never be sure that these writings represent an accurate cultural cross-section. But on top of that, even if we could accurately know the average first century Jewish person's mindset, we cannot know every individual's mindset. So even if something would be out of the ordinary for the average Jewish person at the time, that in no way diminishes its possibility. Talk a little bit about that and how you might answer that if somebody said, well, it's just imaginative storytelling. Yeah, the way that we answer this question thinks, oh, the gospel writers were just making it up. If they made up the resurrection stories that are embedded in the four gospels, they did a terrible job. I mean, I agree, but notably there's no indication in the four gospels that the authors intended their books to be read side by side with the other gospels. And indeed, there are indications that this was exactly not what they would have intended. John, for instance, goes out of his way on a number of occasions to directly contradict the Synoptic Gospels on a number of details. For instance, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray before his arrest, during which time he is clearly in agony over what is about to happen to him, praying that God take this cup away from him. But in John, he just goes to the garden that he knows that Judas will leave the soldiers to, and when they arrive, he confidently confidently identifies himself as the man they want, and his confidence causes his soldiers to cower in fear. Then, after Peter cuts off a guy's ear, Jesus tells him to put his sword away, finishing that command with the question, Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Another instance of John explicitly contradicting the synoptics is during the crucifixion, when the synoptics have Jesus being unable to carry his own cross, so the Romans force a man named Simon to carry it for him, something that in and of itself is completely unprecedented in Roman law. Carrying the cross was a part of the punishment, so to compel someone who has not stood trial and been found guilty of crucifixion-worthy crimes to carry a crucifixion victim's cross would be akin to forcing a random court attendee to serve the first few years of a murderer's life sentence. But that aside, the Synoptic Gospels all say that Simon was compelled to carry Jesus' cross for him. No reason why is given, but the implication is that Jesus was too weak from his pre-crucifixion beatings. Notably, the story in the Synoptic seems to indicate that Jesus did not carry his cross at all. It goes straight from the soldiers mocking him, to Simon being forced to carry it, to them being at Golgotha, heavily implying that Simon carried it all the way there. But when we turn to the corresponding passage in John, it doesn't just skip over Simon, it explicitly states that Jesus carried his own damn cross. These sorts of explicit contradictions are weird if we think that the Gospel authors were all in agreement and wrote their books with the intention that they be read together. Rather, it appears as though, at least in John's case, the picture of Jesus that had grown in the Christian community to basically be an actual human incarnation of God, as opposed to just an ordinary human guy that God adopted as his son, and since Jesus actually is God, it is not only impossible for him to be in agony or unsure of himself or not wanting to carry on with God's plan, it's downright blasphemous to suggest something like that. So he wrote his gospel, apparently with the knowledge that you might have read one of the other ones, and goes out of his way to counter the blasphemous claims made by the other gospels. But that's just the most striking example of the Gospels being in competition with each other rather than being different perspectives meant to be read together. All throughout, even the synoptics, you get instances of the authors changing details in order to fit the character of Jesus that they wanted to portray, as well as doing things like correcting geographical or theological mistakes. Um, we have female witnesses that not only witness Jesus' resurrection, females are the first to touch him, to dine with him. Not sure where you're getting that the women were the first to eat with him. Hell, in two out of the four Gospels, Jesus appears to the men first. In Luke, the women see the empty tomb, report it to the men, and then his first appearance is to two of the men on the road to Emmaus. He then breaks bread with them, but disappears before eating anything. In Mark, the original ending doesn't even have an appearance of Jesus. The women run away from the empty tomb and say nothing to anyone because of their fear. But if we go with the longer ending, he does appear to the women first, though it is a rather blatant tonal shift from the rest of Mark. He just pops in out of nowhere and casts seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. She then tells the disciples, and they refuse to believe her. He then appears to two disciples out in the country, but the rest of the disciples once again don't believe them. He then finally appears before all eleven of them while they're eating, gets mad at them for not believing that he was back from the dead before seeing it for themselves, and gives the snake-handling version of the Great Commission. In none of the Gospels does it mention Jesus eating. 
Rather, he seems to enjoy interrupting meals. But also, in two of the Gospels, it explicitly mentions that nobody believed the women. It wasn't until the men started seeing Jesus that they started believing. And in the other two, it leaves it ambiguous. In Matthew 28, 16, the disciples go where the women told them Jesus would meet them, but even after Jesus appears, some of them doubted. So this could easily be read as the disciples just humoring the women by going there. Though it could also be read as most of the disciples just believing them. Could go either way, really. But but notably, Jesus' message to the women was just to tell the men where he would meet them in order to deliver his proper message. In John, there is no mention of whether or not the men believed the women, but again, the first thing that happens when the empty tomb is discovered is that the women run back to get the men to verify that the tomb is actually empty. But once again, John has Jesus give the women a message for the men, not for them. Jesus gives the men the real message later, which includes him breathing magical forgiveness powers onto them? I hope he brushed his teeth first. After three days of rotting, I'd imagine his breath didn't exactly smell like roses. Um, you wouldn't start there if you knew anything about uh, Greco-Roman Empire, and even even the, even the Jews in Judaica, you wouldn't begin there. I mean, I think of Rabbi Judah who said, better to burn the Torah than teach it to a woman. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not agreeing with that, obviously. Right. I'm just saying you, we, have to, we have to see the New Testament world with first century eyes. Which, again, is impossible to do with perfect accuracy. But from what we do know, it was normal for women to perform the ceremonial washing of dead bodies. It would not be out of the ordinary for men to do it as well, at least for male bodies, but women could do both male and female bodies. This cleansing is supposed to be done as soon as the person dies, well before they are placed in the tomb. So the delay is a bit weird and never really explained in the Bible, but the fact that it's women doing it is perfectly normal. You're asking me one of the best questions right now, what if it is imaginative storytelling? What do we say to that? Well, in Luke chapter 24, verse 21, the, uh, on the road to Emmaus, and I've been there in the land of Israel. In fact, I've been at the, the tombs near the town of Emmaus. Oh my God, just get to the fucking point. Who cares whether or not you've actually been there? Um, the, one of them, we actually have their name. So we have eyewitness testimony here, Cleopas. Fun fact. Knowing someone's name does not magically make a story that is told about them in the third person eyewitness testimony. My buddy Gord once survived a fall off the Hoover Dam. There, you have his name. It's Gord. So that's eyewitness testimony, right? You see how that doesn't work? Um, they don't realize they're walking with the resurrected Jesus, and they said they're dejected. They said, you know, we had hoped he was the, re he was the Messiah, but, you know, he died and it's done. There's a finality to it. They have truly given up, and they, they're walking seven miles home. You keep misrepresenting these stories. Their conversation during their walk was a deliberation about whether or not they should believe the women who said that Jesus was still alive. But either way, who cares? I don't see how this completely uncorroborated story somehow counters the idea that the Jesus story is just a story. And also see the symbolism, they're walking away from this faith as well. No one expected the Messiah to die, Elisa. And this is where I wanna really help our audience as a professor. We open up Isaiah 53 today in our scriptures and it just seems so clear that mm -hmm. this is the coming suffering servant. Very few Jews in Jesus's day would have interpreted Isaiah 53 the way that we see it now with the historical and theological hindsight. You Realize that that's a point against you, right? If it requires hindsight to correctly interpret a prophecy, then that prophecy was not, in fact, prophetic. It was reinterpreted to fit events with the benefit of hindsight. Do you not see how that is a point in favor of the idea that the Jesus story was invented out of a handful of guys engaging in the sunk cost fallacy, wanting to find anything that would make Jesus' execution make sense? especially given that the suffering servant is clearly a metaphor for Israel in that passage, not Jesus. Unless, of course, you believe that Jesus had children and lived to old age and so was able to see his offspring and prolong his days, as is said in Isaiah 53.10. In my experience, that's not a very common Christian viewpoint. Generally, apologists just ignore that passage completely. When it is addressed, they focus on the offspring part, pointing out that it's a metaphorical offspring, not literal children. We are all children of God, so we are all his offspring that he's seeing. But it ignores the prolong his days part of the verse, which doesn't fit with any of the language used to describe eternity anywhere else in the Bible, so it's clearly referring to old age in terms of earth years. We see that there are actual prophecies in the Dead Sea Scrolls community that when Messiah comes, 
not only would he be a great conqueror, he would kill the Katim. He would kill the Romans. That was their name for the Romans. He would even kill the Roman emperor. He would not die on a cross. No one expected Messiah to die. Again, I don't see how you think this helps your case. The common belief was that the Jewish Messiah would win a military victory over the Romans. Therefore, the story of Jesus being a spiritual Messiah rather than a Messiah that would save Israel from earthly conquest can't possibly just have been a story that people came up with to deal with the fact that the guy they thought would free them from Roman rule ended up being executed by the Romans? And somehow the fact that the obvious interpretation of the Messianic prophecies was that the Messiah would be a military leader and the reinterpretation of the Messiah as a spiritual savior only happened in hindsight supports the idea that the reinterpretation is correct rather than the obvious interpretation? There were many messianic pretenders in the first year, first two centuries of nascent Christianity. Yes, there were. So is it really such a wild idea that one of them was successful enough in gathering a following that when he was executed, a few of his followers were then motivated to reinterpret prophecies in light of events that had already happened? They don't even need to have been lying about it. As I've pointed out in other videos on this channel, a simple grief hallucination would be enough to do the trick, especially if someone had enough motivation to believe that the hallucination were real. Such hallucinations are quite prevalent, with research suggesting that anywhere from 30 to 60% of bereaved individuals experience them, irrespective of any prior religious belief. So all it would take is one or two of Jesus' followers experiencing such hallucinations, interpreting that as Jesus being raised from the dead, and then some people believe them. Then we have at least 30 years for legendary growth to happen to this barebone story before the first of the Gospels is actually written down. They were contenders or pretenders. Jesus wasn't the only one who went around and said, hey, I'm the Messiah, follow me. He seems to be completely unaware that the implication of what he just said is that Jesus was also a pretender. That's fun. Others did. In fact, we have two that are named in the book of Acts and their following went away. The only reason that Christianity carried on, and I want to make sure our audience doesn't miss this fact, is because of the resurrection. Yeah, no. We all know that ideas that are untrue always die out. None of them ever last to become culturally entrenched despite a complete lack of evidence. Just ask my chiropract- Oh, wait. Okay, I heard it. Man, my astrologer was right on the money this week. All they did was report what actually happened because it really did, and that started the movement. How do you know that? How could you possibly know that? You seem to be basing this whole thing on the objectively incorrect assumption that ideas or stories that are not actually true cannot ever come to be accepted by a large population as true. But that's just not true. We've got all sorts of wrong ideas floating around in our culture today, from conspiracy theories to obviously fake religions and everything in between. And the beauty of it is, we don't even have to have the same opinion about these various ideas in order to agree on the conclusion that wrong ideas are prevalent throughout society. If you believe that 9-11 was an inside job, you are likely convinced that I am completely wrong when I say that it was not. And you would likely also agree that most people do not agree that it was an inside job. That is, it is an incorrect idea that is pervasive throughout society. But if you do not believe that it's an inside job, you are likely to have a similar opinion about those that do. So we can all agree that incorrect ideas have the ability to spread rapidly throughout society, even when there is ample available evidence that proves those ideas wrong definitively. So to then turn around and say that we know that Christianity is true because otherwise it wouldn't have spread through society is to just ignore everything we know about human nature. We trust in the facts of the gospel, and that content doesn't change. Doesn't it, though? There are a bunch of changes to the gospels that are recorded in the Bible itself. Just read your bloody footnotes sometime. Mark's entire ending was a later edition. The Joannine comma, which is the story of the woman caught in adultery, that was a later edition. The Holy Trinity itself never makes an appearance except in a significantly later manuscript. And these are just the changes that we know about. In addition to that, there are changes in translations, with different versions of the same Bible saying vastly different things by making use of interpretative wiggle room during the translating process. And that's ignoring instances of theologically motivated translating, such as when the NIV translation added the word your into the parable of the mustard seed so that instead of saying the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds and thus making an objectively incorrect statement, Jesus said that the mustard seed is the smallest of all your seeds, implying a limited set of seeds from which he was choosing the smallest rather than it being an actual blanket statement. 
There was no indication in any of the manuscripts that the word your should be there, but the translators at the NIV had theological reasons for wanting it there, so they put it in. They eventually took it out in shame, so the NIV version has changed over time. That is an objective fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, those facts of the resurrection of Jesus literally birthed the new church that changed the world. Those stories may have birthed it, but the Roman Empire adopting it as their official religion and spreading it through military conquest is what ultimately gave it the leg up it needed to survive into modernity. Yeah, you mentioned the conference we were at together, and it was such a joy to get to hang out with all of you guys, and Sean McDowell was there, and Alan Parr, and... Fun fact! I mentioned at the beginning of the video that Elisa defends biblical slavery, but Alan Parr, the guy she just mentioned, is the perpetrator of what is quite possibly the most egregious example of Bible verse cherry picking that I have ever seen in his attempt to defend slavery. He quoted Exodus 21 verses 5 through 6 as saying, But if the servant declares, I love my master, ellipse, and I do not want to go free, ellipse, then he will be his servant for life. Now, Let's read what that verse says without the ellipses. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children, and do not want to go free, then the master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or to the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. So it's not just, I love my master so I'll be his servant for life, it's, my master is holding my wife and children hostage as permanent slaves, and if I want to continue to see them, I have to make this declaration and allow him to mutilate me in front of the elders as proof that I'm becoming his permanent slave. Not quite the rosy picture that Alan was trying to paint. But that's a sidetrack. Let's get back to the video! It's not just that we have these theoretical pretenders, right? As you mentioned, the Book of Acts even mentions a couple by name, but he mentioned one by name that, and, and he was talking about the Jewish response to it. And not only was their instinct not to try to redeem the whole thing or, you know, smooth it all over and make this guy into some kind of Messiah, but with one of them when he died, if I'm remembering this accurately, they even changed his name to include mm -hmm. some sort of a connotation of being an actual liar. I really don't understand how they're not seeing this. The Jewish authorities frowned upon these messianic figures who were running around during Jesus' time and went out of their way to portray them as liars and charlatans. Kind of like the stories we see in the Bible of the high priest trying their damnedest to discredit Jesus. This is providing more evidence to the idea that if the Jesus character was based on a real guy, he was just a guy. A rather common figure for the time, actually. Just one whose death happened to inspire an apocalyptic cult that became modern Christianity. Like, really. Add in all the other so-called messiahs, and the chances that one of them had a handful of followers who had the right kind of bereavement hallucination to start a religion after their death goes way up. Because now we're not just dealing with one or two of twelve guys who need to have had a hallucination, we're potentially dealing with only one or two guys out of thousands. I mean, that was the Jewish yes. response. Had Jesus not raised from the dead, uh, all indication we have from history is that they would have turned on him, and he would have been a liar in, in their eyes. Matthew chapter 28 verses 13 through 15 says, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Sounds to me like there was at least the perception in the early church that the Jewish leaders were indeed trying to discredit Jesus. What point do you even think you're making here? And that was such powerful, to me, evidence for the resurrection, because I'd never heard something like that before. Well, you've probably never heard it before because it's completely asinine, even by apologetic standards. If I can disprove your point without even leaving the pages of the Bible to do so, then you should probably avoid making that point while advocating for the truth of the Bible. Well, and that's a great point that, again, many of us don't know until we really study these things at serious uh, levels. At serious levels? The serious level of study here is the idea that the Jewish leaders in first century Judea did not claim that Jesus or his followers were liars. But the Bible literally has a story where they do exactly that and bribe Roman guards to spread rumors among the Jewish community about it. Yeah, that story makes no sense in light of anything we know about Roman or Jewish culture from that time period, but it's still a point of fact that the Bible at least claims that the Jewish authorities were actively trying to discredit the disciples. We have to give um, people credit in the first century. These people were not morons. They would not have followed somebody that was a charlatan, a liar, or a fake. Why, pray tell, do we have to give them this credit? 
especially when the Bible so clearly paints the picture of the disciples as being, to use your description, morons. They constantly can't figure out even the most basic parts of Jesus' message. They're always confused about what he's doing, even if it's something that's pretty much identical to something else that they just saw him do. Again, if we take the Bible as true, the disciples were a bunch of morons. But also, ignoring that, while I wouldn't say that every Christian in the first century was, you know, let's say gullible instead of morons, because that's really the quality that is needed, you can be quite intelligent, but also gullible. So not every first century Christian was gullible, but you also just can't assume that they would have all been hyper-skeptical either. As with today, there would have been a whole range of people who were different amounts of gullible. And I have no doubt that, as is the case today, there were leaders in the church who varied between being sincere believers and being conmen who saw the new religion as an opportunity for exploitation. To take it back to the earlier Mormonism example, I have no doubt that Martin Harris, the guy who financed the original printing of the Book of Mormon, was a sincere believer, and it is well documented that he was, in fact, quite gullible. For instance, in one account it says that he once thought that a candle flickering was the work of the devil, rather than just a candle doing what candles do. But other early Mormon leaders, like Joseph Smith himself, I have no doubt were con men. And surely there were a whole spectrum of people involved in the early church with differing levels of sincerity, con artistry, and gullibility, as there still are today. So thinking that the early Christians would believe something that isn't true based on less than stellar evidence is not being unfair to first century Christians. It's assuming that they were fundamentally the same types of human beings that still exist today. And again, I cannot make this clear enough. They certainly would not have made up a resurrection narrative if it wasn't true. Why? Because the common interpretation of messianic prophecies at the time didn't match that? Well, I hate to break this to you, but the scriptural tradition among ancient Jews held that a text is dead if you could no longer find a new interpretation. Finding new interpretations was literally part of rabbinic tradition at the time, so to say that these guys would never have found a new interpretation because they would have dogmatically stuck to the old interpretation is just flat out not true. How can we say that? Nobody believed in physical bodily resurrection outside of Jews in the first century who believed in a coming general resurrection. So, wait. You're using the fact that the Jews were the only people who believed in any kind of physical resurrection as evidence that a bunch of Jews would not have reinterpreted the Messianic prophecy to be about a physical resurrection? Honestly, the fact that they believed in a final physical resurrection serves as a pretty decent explanation for the zombie apocalypse that we see in Matthew. If he included that detail purely as a way of making the new interpretation fit better with the old interpretation, then it kind of makes sense. But if the Christian interpretation were completely new, then Matthew's zombie apocalypse is completely absurd. And this is where we have to be so careful. Nobody thought that Jesus was physically, or a Messiah was going to die and rise again. This was something that was going to happen, eschatologically speaking, at the end of days. And that would certainly explain why the earliest Christian writings don't seem to include a physical resurrection of Jesus. It's all very spiritual. Paul sees the risen Christ as a vision that others cannot see. Aside from a brief mention of Jesus being buried, notably without any mention of his burial being in a tomb, we don't get anything from Paul to indicate that the resurrected Jesus was actually a physically resurrected Jesus. The physically resurrected Jesus doesn't show up until the Gospels, about 20 to 30 years after Paul wrote his epistles. Admittedly, I ain't no New Testament scholar, but that looks a whole lot like legendary growth as the story is told and retold. Why would you start your narrative there if it didn't really happen and if nobody would have believed it to begin with? Why would you start your narrative for your apocalyptic end times cult with the end of days? Dude, Christianity is now and has always been an apocalyptic religion with every generation believing that they are living in the end times. Paul spelled it out quite plainly in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, well before any of the Gospels were written. Verses 29 through 31 say, This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn live as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. He's not saying that the world will pass away eventually in some nebulous future after a few thousand years. He is saying that it is passing away right now, present tense. 
but he said that 2,000 years ago. Also, as much as I'd like to take verse 29 out of context and say that the Bible tells married men to live as though they have no wives, so open marriages for all! In context, he's talking about how married people will have worldly troubles while single people can focus purely on God. So it's not telling you to sow your wild oats even though you're already married, it's telling you to focus purely on God to the exclusion of your spouse. Still not a great message. Though if you do want to see me take Bible verses out of context and just give them the most ridiculous possible interpretation, I did that in episode 3 of the show where my partner and I read through a Christian marriage book. We got Ephesians 5.25 as respect the dick, John 10.10 is Jesus is Satan, Genesis 3.15 is Eve then did snowball Adam with his own cum. Yeah, we're gross, but it's fun. There's no psychological motivation to make up a resurrection narrative, which is one of my points in the book as well. Again, how can you possibly know that? Why would you think that the disciples would be completely immune to the sunk cost fallacy? Why would they not behave in the way that we know human beings behave today? That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Bastion5975, who says, Wait, you're telling me that Canadians are not literally higher beings that know all due to their elevated position on the globe? Well, Bastion, Canadians are indeed higher beings. But that's just because we legalized marijuana relatively early, and now there are about as many dispensaries as there are Tim Hortons locations. I'm not even kidding, in my town there are five dispensaries, and only two Tim Hortons locations. Three if you include the one at the Duty Free where you have to actually be crossing the border into the United States in order to go to it, so I normally wouldn't count it, but let's give it to them. So it might not hold true throughout the country, but at least in my little corner of it, we're high as fuck. Thanks for watching, I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I livestream with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern on my other channel The Watering Hole, and I stream with my partner every Tuesday at 1pm Eastern here. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, and special thanks as always to my Patrons, who are the religious leaders who call my channel a liar. If you'd like to prove that I'm right because nobody ever called me a liar even though I myself make the claim that people have called me a liar, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my PO Box address is in the description. See you next time! When he was executed, a few of his followers were motivated to reinterpretate. Reinterpretate. That's not a word. <sighs> it's just reinterpret. I'm doing my reinterpretating.